It was her physical appearance as well as the rarity of such a young female offender in South Africa that made her stand out to the media. She was described in many ways as an attractive waif and even as a wildcat hissing in court. Hello and welcome to episode 19 of Makeup and Mayhem True Crime with me, your host, Bella Monsu. The 1980s in South Africa was a time of great stirrings, of great unrest, as it was felt in the air that things were beginning to change. But unfortunately for four young men, they would never live to see those changes. It's true what they say, you can never know a person by just looking at them. Because by just looking at the young, pretty, red-headed girl with her partner and her baby, you would never imagine the atrocities that they had committed. But before we get into that, for those of you who are new, let me introduce myself. So here it is in a nutshell. I'm a mental health professional who just so happens to be obsessed with makeup, true crime, and uncovering the motives that drive people to do what they do. So what this means is that every single week I post a brand new video looking at a real life crime from a psychological viewpoint. Oh, and for my makeup lovers out there, I also complete a super easy to follow makeup look whilst discussing these cases. During these episodes, I also try to share psychological knowledge and concepts that you may or may not know in an easy to understand format. So if that sounds like it is just your cup of tea or coffee or wine or whatever takes your fancy, then please do consider subscribing and joining the Bellaboo family. Just a quick disclaimer for today's story. Today's story contains material citing murder. As always, I will issue further warnings if relevant as the story unfolds. I mean absolutely no disrespect to the victims mentioned nor their families. The purpose of this video is to shed a further light on this series of crimes while spreading awareness about the psychological nature of the narrative. This story has been thoroughly researched by myself and includes real life accounts, footage and images from and of individuals involved directly in this case. On to episode 90. On the 22nd of July 1963, Charmaine Phillips was born to Leo Hoppy Phillips and Johanna Emma Phillips in the Orange Free State. Charmaine was born into misery and angst. Her mother was an alcoholic and her father, who had been diagnosed with schizophrenia, was almost permanently high on Dacha. This unfortunately also exacerbated his schizophrenic symptoms. When she was born, she had three older siblings, but a little bit later on in life, when she was around seven years old, her mother gave birth to twins. And that very same year, her mother tried to kill her husband. Charmaine's father. As one can imagine, from that point, things only deteriorated more rapidly, and it was not long until the social services were there to collect all the children, and they were all put into foster homes. So this next chapter was incredibly traumatic for all the siblings, and in particular, Charmaine, who went on to be severely beaten at her next foster home for wetting the bed. This abuse and treatment unfortunately had a lasting effect on her psychological state of mind and well-being. So for some strange and unknown reason, the children were all later returned to the care, if you could call it that, of Johanna and Leo. They then proceeded to have one last child, therefore bringing the total number of children to seven. So things did not improve in the least in the home. Her mother's alcoholism would result in bouts of anger or depression and on multiple occasions Charmaine had actually walked into the bathroom whilst her mother was attempting to cut her wrists. And you know her father was even worse. So her mother had actually kicked her father out of the house as she had suspected that he was molesting some of his own children. He eventually ended up in a mental institution. Somehow and some way though, 
every now and then he would pop up back in their lives and in their home. So before Charmaine was even 10 years old, her mother had moved all of them, all the children, to a new home in Grayton in what was then known as Natal. So here Charmaine would live with her mother and her siblings and they were quite dependent on welfare and all the shortfall would be made up by her mother working as a sex worker in order to pay the bills. I applaud her mother for doing what she needed to do to look after her family. However, their family home with all of these young children then became a base for her clients to visit. And in that way, Charmaine was exposed to all of the sexual exploits of her mother. As you can imagine, that was not the best environment for children to be raised. And it was not long after that that the children were removed from her care and they were placed into an orphanage in Durban, the first of many homes and orphanages for Charmaine. And Charmaine would never live with her mother again as a few years later word had gotten around to her that her mother had been killed by an angry boyfriend who had smashed a bottle over her head and then proceeded to murder her. And in case you were curious, during this time Charmaine received no mental health care or counselling in order to help her deal with the trauma that she had experienced. So over the next years, Charmaine moved from foster home to foster home until she decided when she was in her last foster home that she was going to try and make it on her own. She was just over the age of 13 at this point. So she left a cake and a thank you note at her foster home before stealing some money and heading off to make it on her own. So because there weren't and aren't very many opportunities for a child in terms of work, she began to live on the streets and she began to engage in sex work. Over the next three years, she then went on for a period of time to live in a boat in the Durban Harbour with a Lebanese sailor. She had then fallen pregnant with his child and he had promptly abandoned her. So shortly after that, she had moved into a home for unmarried mothers in Port Elizabeth and she had given birth to her son. Ricky Lee. As soon as he was born, he was taken into foster care and Charmaine was sent to a school in Cape Town in an attempt to break the cycle of hopelessness and dysfunction that at this point was her life. Keep in mind, she was not even 16 years old at this point. The attempt was quite short-lived though, as Charmaine could see no way of adapting to the authority and the structure of a school environment, especially after being on her own for the last few years. So she lasted the sum total of three hours before leaving, never to return again. She then set off to Port Elizabeth in a bid to be closer to her son, and somehow, it's not really known how, she managed to convince the authorities to return him to her care. She then began to engage once again in sex work and she had later stated, I discovered that selling my empty, heartless body was just as popular in Port Elizabeth as it was in Durban. So during this time, she actually became involved with and got married to another sailor. He was a Greek sailor this time, Gavril Skubridis. She had viewed him as a saviour to her situation and, in her eyes, a way out of South Africa for her and her son. So it's unclear exactly what went on here, but what we do know is that although she was ready to leave, he was a sailor and he had to work on the ocean, and so he had left. He was often gone for long periods of time, and so he had left without them at this point, and so Charmaine had kind of gone back to her normal routine. But their story did not end there. More on that later and trust me, you are not going to believe it. 
Anyhow, one day whilst hanging around the harbour, her usual location, her ex-boyfriend, well one of her ex-boyfriends, stumbled upon her and together they then went in the search for Dacha to get high and catch up, I suppose. At this point in time, she was 17 years old. The man she had approached looked like he was in his 30s, but the moment their eyes had met, she knew that he was something special and someone who was going to change her life. And oh, how he did just that. Peter. Louise David Hrunlong had grown up in Omalo, about two hours away from Johannesburg. According to his family, he appears to have had a normal childhood growing up in the eastern Transvaal within a farming region. Although he was dubbed a good boy by his mother, somehow he landed up in jail. And this was apparently the beginning of his downfall. From that point on, he would be in and out of trouble for the years to come. And the day that he actually met Charmaine, well, he had been granted bail after being arrested on a weapons charge. Charming. As with another couple that I've mentioned within a previous episode, Charnay and Martins, their names may or may not be familiar to you. In any case, I will link a card up above with that episode. Charmaine and Peter's love was doomed. The moment Charmaine had locked her eyes onto Peter's that day in the harbor, it was a match made in hell. Right off the bat, Peter had offered Charmaine a two-week fun trip to Johannesburg, which was about a six-hour drive from Durban, and Charmaine had agreed in a heartbeat. Before long, the two were living on the wild side, drinking, doing drugs, and earning money in the skeeviest of ways. And Charmaine's young child, Ricky Lee, was dragged along for the ride until he was removed from her care and placed into foster care again. This time, however, he would be gone for good, and he was soon after adopted by an Irish couple who took him back to Ireland. Charmaine and Peter really brought out the worst in one another, and sex work soon turned into holdups, where they would rob, steal, spend the money, and then repeat. And up until that point, no one was ever harmed. Well, physically, that is. So this way of life continued for the couple. And on December 24th, 1982, Christmas Eve, Peter Ki was born. Peter and Charmaine's child. Charmaine, at this point, was only 18 years old. It was about six months later on the 15th of June 1983 in the town of Mshloti when the first murder would be committed. So after having spent the previous night in their car with the baby, the couple were determined to get their hands on some money whichever way they could. They soon set their sights on Smugglers Inn on Point Road in Durban. Smuggies, as it was known back then, was the meeting place of both rich kids as well as sex workers and sailors. So it attracted a variety of clientele. That night of June 14th, 1983, Gerald Mayer, who was 34 years old at the time, had walked into the bar after surfing during the day to grab a beer and to watch the rugby. And just a few moments later, Peter had pulled in to the chair next to him and introduced himself. Soon after, he was invited back to the table where Charmaine was sitting and baby Peter Key was asleep in his pram. I mean, that's not really the most sus setup now. Right? So after the three of them had been chatting for a good few hours, Peter had then offered Gerald a joint and a drive, which he had accepted. So after they had been driving for about 20 minutes, Gerald had soon become suspicious because they had turned off the main road. So after Peter had pulled in to an isolated place by the sugarcane fields, he had attempted to get Gerald to leave the car, but Gerald was not having it, at which point the couple had then dragged him out of the vehicle and they had begun to frisk him for any money or valuables that he had on him. And all of this took place whilst a gun was pointed in his face. A moment later, after they had gotten everything they could from his body, he was shot at point-blank range 
by the lovely couple he had just spent his evening talking to. His body was later found on that dusty road near Verulam. After Gerald's murder, the couple lay low for the next three or so days as they watched and heard news of him declared missing and later his body being found. They had then set off for Richards Bay and they had crashed for a few nights in the spare room of one of Peter's friends. They had then used Gerald's money to stock up on their essentials, aka dacha, milk, booze, and diapers, and they had proceeded to keep a low profile for the next few days. Until that weekend, of course, when Peter had gone to the local pub alone, and he had come back with a friend. This friend was Vernon Alexander Swart. He was 28 years old at the time. On June 19th, 1983, Peter had promised Vernon a lift to Impangeni. The couple, along with baby Peterki and Vernon, then set off drinking and playing music in the car. An hour later, in the small town of Malmouth, Peter had pulled the car into some wattle trees. They had then proceeded with the same MO as the previous occasion, however this time their victim Vernon was tied to a tree. Almost instantly he was shot point blank to the head. Later Charmaine would claim that she shot him because he was babbling too much. Peter had then taken about 270 rand off of the body, along with some photographs, and off the couple and baby Peter Kri had headed to spend the night in Richards Bay. They knew they had to keep moving, and so they then headed to Durban, and then they continued to move from town to town with baby Peter Kri in tow, not spending more than 24 hours in a single location. And a week later, they were in Ermelo. Peter's hometown. And this is where they met Barend Gravenstein, who was in his early 30s. Peter had promised him a lift to Kinross, which was about an hour away. And so he had gotten into the car along with Charmaine and baby Peter Key. They had then, however, made a detour in Secunda to watch a game of rugby and have a few drinks with some of Peter's old friends. So Barand was a pretty easygoing, pretty laid back guy and he was okay with this whole setup. It was unfortunately during this time that he had made a joke saying that he would bet all the money in his bank account, which was around 800 rand, on his favorite side. And in the couple's mind, the plan was already in motion. So the group got back into the car and it was a little while later when Peter had pulled up at a dark and quiet dam. It was at this point that the couple had dragged Baron out of the vehicle, they had robbed him of his bank card and demanded his pin code. Upon receiving it, they had then shot him point blank as they had done with their previous victims and they left his body, got back into the vehicle with Peter Key and they continued to drive. This time, however, they only drove a kilometer away to a house of a friend that Peter knew. Unfortunately, Peter's friends were not home, they were actually away, but he managed to sweet talk the domestic worker who was at the home to allow him, Charmaine and Peter Key to spend the night as they were apparently good friends of the family whose house it was. As daylight broke, they had then driven five hours to Bloemfontein, where they had withdrew all of Baron's money. It was here on June 30th of 1983, where the couple would encounter their fourth victim. Martin Mafosi was 25 years old at the time, and he was walking down a road that linked the white-only section of the town, remember it was still apartheid in South Africa during this time, to the outlying township. He was grateful for the lift when the couple stopped and he climbed into the vehicle. However, his fate was soon the same as the victims that had come before him. He was driven to a secluded spot, he was robbed of all the meager possessions that he had on him, and he was shot point blank. And he would be their last victim. 
So what I find pretty amazing, especially for the time during when this happened, is that whilst Peter and Charmaine were on the run, police had started to cotton on to the fact that these murders that they had been finding had the same modus operandi. At this point in time, the murder spree had lasted around 17 days. So, although there were no eyewitness accounts of the actual murders, there were many people who had seen the couple with the victims prior to them going missing. And so, a few days later, an APB was put out on Police File, which was a weekly television show with Charmaine and Peter's faces, as well as a plea for any further information. And so, a three-week manhunt began, with newspapers and the media going wild. It was also around this time that the couple were beginning to be referred to as Bonnie and Clyde. Charmaine and Peter knew that time was running out. And so after they successfully got past a Johannesburg roadblock, they had taken baby Peter Key in a small white baby grow and a bib with tiny blue bears wrapped in a blanket to Peter's brother and Charmaine's sister-in-law's home. Peter's brother, Adam Grinling, lived in a block of flats in Loveday Street in Bromfontein. Essentially, Charmaine had just knocked on the door. As soon as the door was open, she had handed the baby to Adam's wife and she had left before she had said anything. Attached to Peter Key's baby grow was a note that said, Peter Key's clothes are at the Johannesburg station. Please fetch them from there. And with that, they were gone. The couple had then ditched their vehicle and they had stolen a red Kawasaki motorcycle, which they were later caught riding near Freenaging. They were, of course, arrested. In October of 1983, the trial of Charmaine Dawn Phillips and Peter Hunlung began. The couple had initially pleaded not guilty to six charges of murder, robbery and fraud. Peter's mother, who was 66 years old at the time, showed up every single day to court to support. Charmaine, on the other hand, didn't really have anyone there for her every day. However, she became the center of all media attention. It was her physical appearance as well as the rarity of such a young female offender in South Africa that made her stand out to the media. She was described in many ways as an attractive waif and even as a wildcat hissing in court. To be honest, from the descriptions of how she performed in court, I feel like she kind of enjoyed the attention. She would giggle, she would stick her tongue out, she would even hiss like a cat and use foul language, so much so that the judge reprimanded her on multiple occasions during the trial. On one occasion, she had even turned to a photographer in a coy manner as if to speak to him, and when he had approached her, she had spat in his face. And so this went on until around three weeks later, she was ordered by the judge to be sent in for psychiatric evaluation. For an extended period of time, I think it was around three months, she was observed, but she was soon returned to court and she was declared fit to stand trial. I will, however, discuss some of the psychological findings in a little bit. So as the trial proceeded, the pair both individually claimed to take full responsibility for the murder. Charmaine had even stated that she would tell the honest truth and that her reason for killing them more or less, was that he had got fresh with me. However, on the other hand, Peter had made statements taking full responsibility for the murders. But unfortunately for them, whatever plan that they had had in mind was kind of thwarted as the judge realized what was happening. During this time, the death penalty was still around, so it was deduced that Charmaine had probably thought that if she had taken full responsibility, she could save Peter being hung. She herself would not be eligible to face the death penalty as she was under the age of 21. On the day of judgment, the judge referred to the couple as staggeringly wicked and said, sentenced Peter Hrunlung to death and gave Charmaine four life sentences. The judge had later gone on to say that Charmaine escaped the death penalty by the narrowest of margins. And you know what Peter had to say? I hope I get cigarettes before I go to the gallows. And Charmaine had apparently said to her father who had been there during the sentencing, I'm going to have wrinkles the day I get out of jail. Did dad not bring a little marijuana for me? 
The gallows at Pretoria Central, where Daisy DeBalka and Elefasi Mumsomi from two previous episodes were hanged, were commonly frequented during this time by mostly black prisoners. In a year where a hundred prisoners were hung, for example, only three of them had been white. Prior to their death, these inmates were kept in a section of the prison known as the pot for seven nights. It was dubbed this so that the wardens could watch the prisoners stewing in their own fear. As was customary, the prisoners were also given the option to see three people before their execution. Peter had requested to see Ivor Human, who had investigated the killing spree. Peter had then told him that he had found Jesus before handing him a folded confession wherein he took full responsibility for the crimes. However, it was believed that this was simply a tactic to protect Charmaine from whatever awaited her in prison. And so, on the 30th of July 1985, Peter Grunlung was hanged. His remains were buried in an unmarked grave in a section of the Zanfontein Cemetery allocated to paupers and condemned prisoners. The only direction to his grave? Pretoria, Block M, in the ninth row, the 20th grave to the left. Charmaine, on the other hand, had began to adapt to prison life in the Kronstadt Women's Prison. She had spent the first six years of her sentence rising up through the hierarchy of the gang system, her feisty spirit and nature coming in useful. That same feisty nature, though, did get her locked up into solitary confinement a good few times. In her seventh year in prison, she found God as well as her calling as a talented hairdresser. About her, a warder had later said, I had heard about this prisoner who killed all those men. But when I met her, I could see that she's no longer the same person who committed those crimes. She looks like an ordinary lady, not a killer. She's quiet and reserved. Although there's a sense of sadness about her, I think she's found peace within herself. She's dignified. Throughout the years, though, all she longed for was Peter Key, the baby that she had abandoned. For Peter Key, life was not easy, as you can imagine the burden that comes with being the child of an infamous killer couple. It was also a bitter irony that his young life followed the sad pattern of his mother's. As a child, just like his mother, he moved from one foster home to the next. Through the many turns that life took him, by the age of 12 years old, he was already involved in criminal activities. It was reported that at the age of 15, he met his mother for the very first time since he was a baby. He began using drugs in his adolescence, and when he was 21, he was back in jail for 18 months due to possession of stolen goods. However, once he was in legal Corp prison, he had requested a transfer to Kronstadt prison in order to be closer to his mother. And so every second Wednesday, when prisoners were allowed a short visit with one another, the two would see each other. After serving nine months of his sentence, he was paroled. He continued to visit her after his release twice a month. A correctional officer who wanted to remain anonymous had later said, He sits with her and hugs her. You can see he loves her very much. And it was just a few months later on the 20th of August 2004 that Charmaine was released on parole at age 41 years old after serving 20 years of her sentence. Charmaine would then go on to spend the next year and a bit bonding with her son. It was later discovered that he had become a male sex worker and he had contracted HIV. And then 18 months after Charmaine had been released from prison in March 2006, Six, her son, Peter Grunlung, passed away. He had allegedly died in his sleep at his home alone in Friededorf. The priest at his funeral had said, I never met Peter, but Charmaine told me how loved and wonderful he was. He had a lot of hang-ups, but his heart was always with Jesus. On the work front, the very day that Charmaine was released from prison, she had actually found a job as a hairdresser with a gentleman named DLV who owned a hair salon in Kronstadt. This is where she had begun the intense journey of reintegration into a society that was so very different to the one she had left in the 80s. Imagine. And in case you were curious, here's a quick look at what life was like in the 80s when she was incarcerated. 
Coming out of jail did not equate to complete freedom for Charmaine though, and her parole conditions were strict. She could only be away from her house or a place of work for four hours per day. She could not speak to the media. She could not touch drugs or alcohol, amongst other conditions. Breaking any of these conditions would mean that she would have to return to prison. And although some of her conditions were reviewed after the 18-month period, she will always be on some form of parole for the rest of her life. This was not enough for some of the families of the victims though. Prior to her release, she wrote a letter to the families of the victims, pleading for their forgiveness and hoping that her years of incarceration would act as some form of consolation. She had said, I am sorry and regret the loss, grief and harm we inflicted upon you and your deceased loved ones. And in regards to the consolation, if not, I pray that God, through his grace and mercy, will plant a seed of forgiveness in your hearts for us, so that you too may experience the wonder of God's healing powers. To her own family, she wrote, I regret and I'm sorry for the grief, suffering and embarrassment my actions and decisions have caused you. She had also apologized to the Department of Correctional Services for the years you suffered under my low self-esteem, negative attitude and slow progress. I thank you for your discipline, patience and guidance. Lastly, Charmaine also thanked those who helped to humanize her. I wish you success in assisting other offenders in regaining their dignity and self-worth. Leon Gravenstein, the brother of Barind, maintained that she should remain behind bars for killing four people. He had said, I do not understand how the system works. She did something she knew was wrong and must be punished for her actions. It is as though the authorities are saying, to hell with the families and let's release Phillips because she has done her time. That does not work for me. And many others share this opinion too. But as I do in other episodes, I want to dive in to a psychological understanding of her actions. The reasons behind the murders may never be fully known by anyone other than Peter and Charmaine. Perhaps there was a darkness within them that the other had noticed and together it had grown. Or perhaps it was the drugs and adrenaline that led them in a constant search for new thrills. What I do know is that Charmaine represented the quintessential golden girl during the apartheid era. And so the discovery of what she'd done was sure to bring countless theories and media mongers to light. Psychiatrist Lucas Steenkamp, who had given evidence for three days during the trial after a month-long observation of Charmaine, confirmed that her childhood had a marked effect on her. He had stated, Her intimate personal relationship suffered as a result as she did not have the necessary empathy. Charmaine Phillips was born into a violent family, and the bonds between the family members were strained, even if they seemed to be happy moments in between the trauma. Being surrounded by parents who are constantly intoxicated or mentally ill and off of their meds has a profound effect on the children who are under their care. There is little concern for their well-being and they are often not a priority or main interest. This often leads to children acting out and this can be in a bid to try and get the parents' attention or alternatively, as a way to try and seek the attention and validation that they are lacking from an external source. If Charmaine's upbringing is anything like she says it was, it would stand to reason that she was consistently seeking validation, comfort, acceptance, and love from external sources. And in her case, she was seeking that validation from men. With the Bonnie and Clyde syndrome that Peter and Charmaine had, for example, the man is often a father figure to a woman who comes from a more unstable background where she lacked that father figure. There is no doubt that Charmaine was infatuated with Peter. She would stare, smile and even blush whilst catching his eye during the trial. Dr. Irma Labeshkachny, a forensic criminologist who had visited Charmaine prior to her release, had said, I sincerely hope she'll be able to start a new life in peace and quiet. She is a very vulnerable and reserved girl. During the trial, it was stated on many occasions that Charmaine was what is known as a psychopath. 
it was also established that Peter had antisocial personality disorder. For those of you who are not aware, personality disorders are fixed and thus they are not likely to change throughout a lifetime. Whilst we cannot know exactly what went on within Charmaine's family, what we do know is that it is evident there were problems within her parents and thus there were strained interpersonal relationships within the whole family. The issues that the parents had within themselves and within their relationship were then projected onto the children and thus affected the environment in which they grew up in. So although Charmaine had seven siblings, she didn't have a formal support structure. By the time she and Peter were caught, her brother Leo had already served a prison sentence for armed robbery. Her younger brother Mark was involved in the same robbery. Another brother and sister of hers were in a safe home and her other sister was in a mental health institution. Dr. Labishkachny went on to say that with everything in her life taken into account, I think the crimes she committed were more influenced by her situation at the time than by inherent structured evil. She further stated, In my interviews with her, I could find no indication that she consciously wanted to hurt someone, physically or emotionally. Greed, malice and self-interest are not part of her character. Charmaine does not lie and she does not manipulate people as was testified in the trial. All she has to contend with at present is poor self-image. So I guess at the end of the day, it's a question on what is believed. Does one believe that she acted out of her own volition or does one believe that she was heavily influenced by this older male figure? Regardless of what you believe, I think it still should be noted that no matter how much progress she has made, that can never undo the pain and the damage that she has caused. And lastly, to just add one last theory to the mix, as well as to leave you something to ponder with, especially those who are interested in psychological theory. I give you the idea of shared psychosis, also known as folie à deux or madness of two. So at this point, you may be asking yourself, well, Charmaine Phillips was let out on parole, so where in the world is she now? Three years after being released, Charmaine got married to Henny Robbie, who was described as being the complete antithesis to the men she had known before. But can I tell you, I was floored whilst researching to discover that Charmaine, after divorcing Henny, got remarried in 2019 to a Greek man. But not just any Greek man. Oh no, remember Gavril Skubridis? Yeah? Him. Over 40 years later, they were reunited. How insane is that? Over the years, the media made a massive deal of this case, especially when it broke in the 80s. There was also a movie made in 2013 called Durban Poison, which is based on Charmaine and Peter's twisted narrative. As always, I will leave the info in the description for those of you who want to check it out. And so, with that, we've reached the Bella bottom line. A match made in hell. Each moment spent together, only adding fuel to an already out-of-control fire. They were bound to be casualties. Whether acting together, acting in fear, or acting in devotion, at the end of the day, four innocent men lost their lives. Four families are forever destroyed by the actions of both Charmaine and Peter. And now I pose a question to you, the viewer. Do you agree with Charmaine being released into the world or do you believe that she should have remained behind bars for the rest of her life? And so concludes today's episode. Thank you so much for the support. I can't believe that we are well on the way to 2,000 subscribers. I am so excited and I am so thankful to each and every single one of you. Until next week, my loves, stay safe, stay awesome, and stay blessed. Bye!